Okay. So, uh, growth moments. So, um, I want to tell some stories just about the major growth moments in some of the groups that I've worked with, uh, and then extrapolate some principles about how those uh, moments of growth occurred, and talk a little bit about sustained growth. And then that'll be where we are. So um, let's start with move on. So move on, uh, as you know, it topped out around 3.4. It's vacillated 3.1, 3.2, 3.4 members over the last year and a half or so, two years almost. Uh, at the at move on's current size, it has to replenish itself by about 700,000 new members a year just to not fall in, in net size uh, because of the rate of bounces and unsubscribes, mostly bounces, uh, just emails going bad, that sort of thing. Um, what's interesting, Move On started in 1998. Uh, how many of you know the story of Joan and Wes and impeachment and how it all began? All right, sweet. So everyone sort of move on. Not a lot of people know this story. It's a fun story uh, and it's the first growth moment. So Wes and Joan, a uh, couple living in Berkeley, California, not professional activists at all, uh, it was in the middle of impeachment. The Congress is impeaching Clinton for, and uh, everyone thinks it's crazy. Uh, well, everyone that they know and we knew, and you know, but it seems like we're all insane. Are we alone? What's going on to the country? They put a petition on a website, www.moveon.org, uh, and the, uh, the text is, Congress should censure President Clinton and move on to the official business facing the country. Move on. And so they put it in move on to work. That was it. No intention to start an organization. No intention for it to last. No intention it for, to be anything other than the expression of these two people and their friends. Send it to 60, 80 of their friends or whatever in their email address book. Within a few months, half a million people had signed. Uh, so that's the first great viral growth moment. Um, there's only four that are really huge in MoveOn's now 10-year history, which is not something everyone knows. Uh, the second one was uh, right after 9-11. Uh, this punk kid uh, named Eli Pariser, uh, maybe get emails from him sometimes, uh, was living in his apartment in New York City, saw the whole thing happen, and uh, was worried, uh, given our president, uh, that there might be a disproportionate response, an excuse to march to war. <laughs> It's crazy. And so he um, put up a petition that's a 9-11, uh, we should have a peaceful response to 9-11, uh, that we should treat it as a crime, we should punish the guilty uh, with all due speed and diligence, but we shouldn't take it out on innocent people. Pretty simple proposition, right? In, more innocents should not die. Uh, it was again in a time when the war drums were beating. Uh, people who felt that way thought maybe they were alone or crazy. Uh, turned out they weren't. Put it online, sent it to his friends. Again, 400,000, half, 400, half a million people uh, within a few weeks. And, and this one went global. Third big moment. Uh, let the inspections work. Flash forward a couple of years, 2003, the march to war. We've got inspectors, Hans Blix, running around Iraq. Uh, Bush is clearly planning on ignoring them. A petition to the United Nations Security Council. Uh, it says, let the inspections work. Uh, 700,000 people, I think. Huge. Um, and then the last one, the, the last of these big, there's been many you know, moderate growth moments, but the last of these big ones, uh, save NPR. Uh, 2000, was it 2005, uh, there was a, uh, a threat to NPR, Republican Congress, going to cut, oh, sorry, National Public Radio. Um, and, well, public broadcasting, actually, overall. So it included Sesame Street and Big Bird and National Public Radio and all of that. Uh, so just simple, Congress is going to cut funding, we've got to do something about it. So those are... Um, those are the four big moments. And I'll sort of extrapolate principles from these later. I just want to give you the history. So then Avaz uh, started very recently, just a little bit over a year ago, began with a petition calling for a ceasefire between Israel and Lebanon in that conflict that you'll all remember from about a year ago. Um, that blew up. Uh, there was a petition in October of last year uh, to uh, ask China to pressure the Burmese government uh, to uh, stop cracking down on monks. When it was that, remember that big, high-profile crackdown on monks in Rangoon? Uh, and that went huge, 800,000 people, I think. And then this latest one that we're still sort of riding the wave of as we speak is uh, the Tibet campaign. Again, asking China to uh, meet with the Dalai Lama and uh, to stop the violent crackdown on Tibetan protesters. So those are three, uh, and this one, one in 1.2, 1.3 million signers. It is, I mean, it's just huge, largest in, in history of this particular kind. Um, Get Up, the Australian equivalent, began with uh, a petition to protect their public broadcasting, Australia public broadcasting. Um, so when it comes to growth, by the way, the number one piece of advice I could give any of you is if you ever can find or fabricate or create a threat to public broadcasting, campaign on that, it's really good. 
Uh, even if it's like another branch of your own organization that's threatening it, just make it happen. Um, the David Hicks uh, was a uh, Australian who uh, was being held in Guantanamo, an Australian national, not being given a fair trial. Uh, so there was a big petition effort to give him a fair trial. Um, and to the Australian government. Uh, and a refugee campaign, this was the other really big one. Uh, this was front page news. Uh, no Child Behind Bars was the campaign. There were children being held in a detention camp, I think in Nauru. Um, big petition to stop that. So those are the big growth moments in Move On of Oz and Get Up. Uh, and there's been steady growth throughout, but really just those moments. Now one thing to think about, by the way, just sort of that's immediately obvious about all of this, that we all want growth and we're all sort of striving for growth all the time, but do remember that in the history of these organizations, you know, many years long, uh, that the uh, growth, it, when it happens in giant, giant spurts, uh, often is, is very uh, rare, few and far between. I move on, you know, has had four moments at this level in 10 years, so don't kick yourself if it doesn't happen immediately, um, but always be in a position to make it happen. So let's talk about what do we learn from these things. So when I look at all of these moments, and I sort of step back and think, what do they all share in common, and how can we recognize these moments when they come, how can we structure campaigns around these moments so that they achieve that level of growth for our organizations, what sort of common denominators emerge that we can sort of take to heart as lessons and then apply in our work. So here's what I come up with, and you guys, you know, you'll have your own yeah, insights too, which we can talk about. Um, Urgent and rapid. These are some of the, I mean, it's obvious, but uh, these, th there's an urgency in each of these moments. Something has just happened, uh, and there's a, a, a real palpable sense of speed, um, and there's a need to react very quickly, and uh, often the email coincides, the campaign coincides with the news event uh, very, very closely. Not in all cases, but in most cases. And, and sometimes the urgency is obvious by the nature of the event, and sometimes it is sort of built into the appeal. Uh, uh, and sometimes, like in the case of impeachment, uh, it's only urgent in that we just freaking couldn't take it anymore. And if somebody didn't do something, we were going to blow up. Uh, so th there's different ways to think about urgency. It doesn't always mean there's a vote tomorrow at 12 o'clock in Parliament and we have to act now. Uh, it can be a feeling that people have about a situation. But it, 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 the feeling is consistent, even if the circumstances that generate the feeling are not. So in thinking to yourself about campaigning for growth, Always think about that sense of urgency and where it might come from and how you can play it out in your campaign. Point number two, that's one obvious, visceralness. I thought about lots of different ways of describing what I mean here. Visceralness, I don't even know if it's a word, seems like the best to me. And what I mean is, um, it, it, these campaigns all involve imagery that you can instantly see and understand. Now, a lot of us campaign on big issues and concepts and budget allocations and millions of dollars and uh, rights and you know things like that. Um, where these campaigns all take off is that they have clear visceral imagery. Public broadcasting is Big Bird. It's your kid in front of the television watching Big Bird. Uh, or you listening to National Public Radio and, and, and being so happy about it on your way to work every day. Uh, letting the inspections work. You, you see Hans Blitz you know, going around Iraq and you're like, come on, just like let him do that, uh, and you get it instantly. Uh, David Hicks, you know, you see him in Guantanamo. You, you, you get that immediately. Monks being beaten in the streets of Rangoon. You picture it. You've probably seen it uh, in the news, but you picture it. You get it. Um, so visceralness. Always think about how do you take find imagery and organize campaigns around things that have that instant, clear visceralness. You see it. You get it right in here. Okay. It's all of these things have share in common that they are a way to um, get at a larger problem about which there is a great deal of passion, um, but about which there is not a great deal of actionability, or we worry that there's not a great deal of actionability. Uh, but these provide little ways into it. Um, let the inspections work. So that's a very particular ask around this particular piece, and it's to the Security Council, and it's at this moment, we're really concerned about war, and, and move on to lots of petitions about don't go to war. But they were too broad for enough people to really feel like that would work. As even though they agreed, it didn't quite hit until they found, let the inspections work. This very clear sort of way into the larger problem. Uh, you know, similar with uh, Burma. You know, it's, it's an issue a lot of us have cared about for a 
long time. We, we've seen it for a long time. Or Tibet, you know, we know about it. We've gone to marches or heard about it or whatever. But now we have a discreet way into the issue. Negotiate with the Dalai Lama. That's the ask. Get China to negotiate with the Dalai Lama. It's a way into the larger problem of human rights in Tibet that feels actionable and makes you feel like you're doing something about this larger issue that you care about. Whereas if we just went straight at it, if the petition was free Tibet, or don't do bad things around human rights, China, uh, it wouldn't feel actionable enough, even if it was urgent or whatever, uh, for people to really get into it. So think about the issues in which people are passionate overall, uh, but don't feel like they have entree into something actionable. These all share in common that they gave uh, members that entree. Okay, uh, clear impact. They all, uh, there was a way in which they were all going to do something to uh, affect decision makers to accomplish their goal that was instantly uh, very, very clear. Um, so, uh, one example I like a lot, the refugee campaign from uh, GetUp. So the promise was that if they reached 100,000 signatures, oh, Ollie's here from GetUp, you can testify to this. Uh, if they reached 100,000 signatures, then they would skywrite a vote no above parliament building. Right, Ollie? That's, that was the deal? And people, people saw that. You know, they immediately got it. They're like, holy cow, parliament is going to see it above them as they go in. Clear impact. Clear uh, strategy for making a difference. Um, so obviously, you always have to think about how do you connect uh, your the passion around your issue, the visceralness of it, the urgency of it, with that crucial last step of how will this campaign, this petition, uh, affect decision makers in an equally visceral way that we can clearly see, clearly picture, clearly understand. Um, that's key. Now here's another concept that I think is really important. High energy, high information. So there's a ratio that is really important to think about, I believe, which is the ratio of energy or passion that your members have about a given issue and the information that they have about it uh, at, a, at any given time. Now, the best campaigns are ones that combine high energy with high information. High information usually comes from the media, the media environment. So it's big in the news, everyone knows about the thing that you're talking about. You don't have to give them any new information really in your email. It's just getting them to take action on something they already know about. Uh, high passion things are just issue sets that people care about. Now not all of these combined both. Uh, let's take let the inspections work. That combined both. It was totally in the news. Everyone knew about the inspections. Everyone knew about the issue. Uh, you didn't need to explain what that meant. I don't need to explain it to you. We all get it. Uh, and it was very passionate. People didn't want to go to war. They wanted to get into that issue however they could. But NPR was not in the news. Nobody had heard about it. Nobody had any idea it was going on. So that's a low information but high energy issue. Now the key is you have to at least have one or the other. If something is huge in the news and there's moderate passion, you can usually get people to do something about it. Uh, if there's a lot of passion and it's not in the news but they already get the issue so well that all you have to do is signal to them that the time is now and they're getting that information from you, then you can go with it and ideally you have both. But if you are in an environment where you're trying to push your membership on something where there's low information, it's not in the media, and there's low passion it's sort of wonky or it's obscure or they haven't, just don't even know about it yet. This is the other thing. High passion means high pre-existing passion. They already care about it. So a lot of times we make the mistake of thinking that if we share values or a general issue set concern with our membership, we can push them to, uh, to, to care about something. It's not the case with online organizing. They have to already care. So you always want to think about that ratio with the campaigns that you pick. High passion, high energy. Um, and then the last feature I think all of these things had in common um, is that they were all part of a sustained campaign. These growth moments didn't just happen. There were multiple emails, there were multiple attempts, uh, there were uh, multiple uh, uh, iterations of it. We're going to hit the petition, we're going to do a second uh, time, we're going to have here's our delivery, here's our secondary delivery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so uh, these things really only uh, rise to this level when you find something that's working and you stick with it and you just keep going and going and going. One of the greatest challenges in our work, particularly when we're working in larger organizations, is focus. Uh, because our organizations want to take us in many different ways. Yeah, Joel. Uh, one potential exception to that would be, I think, the Tibet, the recent Tibet action. Uh, I got that email and it was like, boom, click the link, boom, take the action. You know, didn't happen. Yeah, so with the Tibet campaign, there's been a lot of segmented stuff. They've done different versions to different people in different countries and different levels of having taken action or not having taken action. If you hadn't signed, you would have gotten more naggers, that sort of thing. But so internally, uh, yeah. 
Um, I was just interested, you were saying about the sort of nick through high information and high sort of energy. I mean, what would be your, your, your sort of you know, top three on, um, on, on what to do if people don't actually know about your issue yet? I mean, what, what sort of things do you think are useful in terms of promoting the issue? That's a great question. Um, tell you what, I, wanna, I would actually encourage the whole questions until I get to the end because i got some more content to go to, but write it down and come back to me with it because it's really good. Um, okay, so those are the big moments. Now, these are few and far between. I want to speak very briefly about sustained growth sort of what you can do to try to do incremental growth over time. Because for all of us, that's equally as important. Um, so the most important thing, by the way, is that you're constantly trying to get to these big moments. For each one of these moments that succeeded, there are literally dozens and dozens and dozens within all of these organizations, the, the best online organizing minds in the world that just failed or didn't work or worked moderately or whatever. So you always, always, always have to try. And it's not like when these moments occurred, it was instantly obvious to everyone that they were totally different. Uh, Avaz is a good example. We did this Burma thing. Then a little bit later, there was all that violence in Pakistan with Musharraf and the lawyers getting beaten in the streets and we did a whole thing we're like all right it's the same thing this is we're going to grow didn't happen didn't take off uh, and anybody's his guess is as good as mine as to why um, our sort of glib theory is that people like monks and don't like lawyers and uh, <laughs> lawyers getting beaten you know just didn't do it for them um, but uh, but but you've got to uh, you've got to try and try and try and try and try and try so like the number one strategy that I can recommend is think about all of these sort of principles that I outlined about what makes for a big viral growth moment and then guess all the time and just apply them as best you can and keep trying and don't be discouraged uh, by failure. Um, okay, sustained growth. First of all, we all know join, ask doesn't work. It's a very common temptation to just say join us, join, 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 join. Uh, one story I always use to illustrate this point, Move On launched a spin-off group called Moms Rising. Great concept, organizing mothers around a pro-mother, pro-family agenda. We said join, it's wonderful. If you're a mother, we knew we had tons of mothers. Nobody joined. It was like pfft, nothing. They are like, this is terrible. So then we did a thing that was sign a petition for some law that would help mothers do something. I don't even remember what it was. But it was taking action on behalf of that agenda, and it did really, really well and it built a significant base for Moms Rising that they've continued to mobilize ever since. So this simple illustration of the difference between there's all this pre-existing passion and support for that issue set among our base. We were right about that, but we, it just didn't work to say join this new thing. Nobody wants to join, but you'll always get pressure to ask that and you'll be tempted because it's so convenient, uh, but don't, or not very much. Um, so, uh, so find the campaignable moments. Always look to action. Always, every time there's a thing in the news, there's a thing on your organizational agenda, it's always about campaignable action. Part of that is guessing at these viral moments, applying these principles and these formulas, uh, and part of it is just that's your strategy to grow incrementally, replacement growth, you know, so you just always action, 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 action. Action focused, action focused. Um, small technical thing, splash pages, I find they work very well. Most political campaigns use them. There was a major source of growth for our list on the Edwards campaign. Obama's campaign has done really well with it. Issue advocacy groups don't tend to use them. I don't really know why. What is it? What's a splash page? Oh, thank you. A splash page is when you go to a website and the first thing you see is just sort of one big page with some graphics, a little bit of graphics and text, and join. And it says sign up. And like clearly, the, the only thing you can do on that page is either click to not join and go to the website or add your email address and zip code or postcode and join. Um, so if you go to any presidential campaign website, uh, I assume that works from foreign IPs, it will, that's usually what you'll see. And it's a huge source of growth. Plus, even for people who don't join, when they see that splash page, what it does is communicate that joining, being part of this thing, is fundamental to how it operates. Fundamental. Now, that's a major shift for a lot of our issue advocacy groups because they're not used to thinking about that. They've got a lot of information to present and they've got you know things and they don't see joining as that fundamental, that it should be the big only thing that people see when they first come to the website. Uh, but we have found, at least on political campaigns, that it does not discourage overall traffic to the actual website. People are perfectly willing to skip or uh, sign up, and it, it boosts sign-ups tremendously. I don't know why this hasn't caught on in issue advocacy, but it ought to. Um, uh, yeah, so the idea is that by cookies, you don't see it again if you've already signed up. It is a little problem for people who disable cookies. Um, that, that, that is the thing, it's, but I, I still think it's worth it. Um, us rhetoric, movement joining rhetoric throughout every, in, in all ways in which you communicate, uh, your, your principles communicate, the speeches that people affiliated with your group give, the press releases, your online content, just focusing on having a movement-centered grassroots storyline as part of everything you do. Seeps into people's consciousness, helps with sustained growth over time. I'm just going to ask you to hold the questions. Um, 
have clear internal growth targets. Just a structural thing, but a lot of organizations I work with just have no idea how big they want to get or how big would be reasonable. So they don't, they're not measuring it month to month, they're not measuring it year to year, they generally they can. But if you have ambitious growth targets, it's a great way to focus yourself around prioritizing growth campaigns and it's a great way to advocate the rest of your organization around growth campaigns. Um, and lastly, never think that you're too small to start. One of the problems I find with groups with a small list is that they think, ah, you know, it's not really our thing yet. We just, we only have 10,000 members or 5,000 members or whatever. But you're never too small to act as if you have 3 million, with the one exception of trying to do like dense local actions. But in terms of your pure online organizing, you should always act as if you have 3 million, which means the prioritization, which means the resources, which means the consistent flow of content and engagement and action. Um, sounds obvious, but just never think that you're too small to start. Um, so those, that's it. That's the, that's the growth, big growth moments, the principles, the ideas for sustained growth. Now, I see that we are running right...